it is funny that we were very proud of ourselves for doing this. We thought we were being very clever. We thought this was revolutionary television, and we killed our main character. And then we started season two, and we thought, oh shit, we've killed our main character. Hi, I'm Alan Taylor, uh, director of this episode, Baylor. It's episode nine of season one of Game of Thrones, and this is Notes on a Scene. The scene we're showing today is uh, comes at the end of the episode. It's the culmination of several storylines. What we're seeing is the public confession of Ned Stark, who is lying about having committed treason in order to buy off his freedom and the safety of his daughters. And it doesn't go as he intends. If you want more backstory, you can Google it. It winds up being quite a major event in the series. And my approach was to therefore cover it like it was nothing. Uh, it culminates in something terrible that's about to happen. I'm sure none of you know about that yet. We made a very conscious choice not to amp it up, not to do sensational shots, but just to shoot it as though we were covering dialogue and the most horrible thing in the world happens. This is Arya Stark, one of Ned's daughters, who is just realizing that something's going on and it involves her father. For me, the scene kind of starts here. There's a little detail where she's killed a bird because she's trying to survive on the streets, and here we see her drop the dead bird. The bird imagery is something that carries over to later. Doing a scene like this, point of view was incredibly important, and the only way we found to structure it was to think of it and this is something that my DP said, actually, Alex Sakharov, that it's really a story about a father and two daughters. And so we follow their points of view through what to us at the time was a big scene. And the point of view begins with Arya here. It's funny watching it now and seeing just how small and sort of rinky-dink the scene is because Game of Thrones has gone on to be very well funded by HBO. But at this stage, this was season one. No one had seen the show yet. We had no idea if it had an audience or not. And we didn't have a dime. So this is the establishing shot of the scene, and I wanted to do it through the daughter's point of view, but you'll see the shot we used is kind of strange. It tilts up into the sky for no apparent reason, and then tilts back down to show the real scene and the stage. First of all, <laughs> it's charming by Game of Thrones standards now because we have you know, not nearly enough extras here. The most telling thing is that shot was designed to show us the awesome architecture of the Septa Baylor, which is this sort of dome-like structure that covers the whole square that we only uh, lost. <laughs> in post, so uh, the shot remains, but not the structure. When I watch it now, I see just how little money we had at the time, but it's, I think it still packs an emotional punch. So the scene continues from here, once we've established it, with Ned Stark being brought out. The structure for shooting it was to connect him to his daughters, so the only time we sort of amp up the coverage was pushing in on Arya, and later on we do the same shot on Sansa. Uh, it's the only time we do a kind of over the top crane in shot, everything else is more standard coverage. But the important thing was to sort of position the two daughters and watch the scene from their point of view. So as the crane shot completes itself, we tilt down to the crowd and, you know, we couldn't afford those guys. <laughs> uh, and Gemma Jackson did an amazing job with what she had, but really the entire set is consists of these banners. Uh, I think we probably argued over how many we could afford, and she built the stage that we're on. Everything else is architecture from Malta. I think we probably shot this in two days. It only became crazy in later episodes. Last episode I did was uh, the Frozen Lake battle in the last season, and that was crazy, like 75 days or something, which, you know, as opposed to your usual week or two. So at this point, it was still, it was not out of hand, it was not extreme. I think the scene is strong and the scene works, but it's almost entirely because of what came before, that um, we care deeply about this guy. We think he's the star of the show. We know he's the moral conscience of the show, and we care about his daughters, thanks to wonderful writing and they're great performances. So it comes to this moment, and all the work's been done already. Uh, the audience really cares about these people. We did little things to make it seem like he might be saved. I mean, I th it's, it's unrealistic, but we see Arya draw her sword, and we know she's badass, and so I think a portion of the audience thinks that she's gonna run up and lead a revolution, and people will, you know, save her father. And we knew we were messing with expectations and structure, and so throughout the season, we, we shot him as though he was the hero, and then we did this sort of perverse thing in episode nine. It is funny that we were very proud of ourselves for doing this. We thought we were being very clever. We thought this was revolutionary television, and we killed our main character. And then we started season two, and we thought, oh, shit, we've killed our main character. And we, we realized, oh, there's a reason why you don't do that, because you depend on the audience being invested and caring through the season two. And we yanked out you know, their, one of their main reasons for being there. But for this moment, in this scene, we still are shooting this as though Ned Stark is the the hero of Game of Thrones. Carrying on, Ned is doing the best he can. Uh, we couldn't afford visual effects, so that was a real rock, but it was a f foam rubber rock being tossed at his head. Nowadays, that would be a visual effect, and we'd add blood with the visual effect, and all the actor have to do is toss his head, but this was the old days and with no money, so this is a piece of foam rubber. Uh, he tosses his head, a makeup artist runs in from the side and puts red on his forehead, and we continue the, the scene. So I'd like to cover the entire scene on actors so that they aren't just sort of picking out little spots, so they have the whole scene to play. We have three cameras going at once, um, so while we're covering Joffrey's 
close up, we'll probably getting Sansa's close up or Cersei's close up at the same time or a three shot of them. That's helpful because the performances match across different frames, but it's just also the only way to get through a scene like this. They're all so good and we're also ready for this big scene that we probably did like three takes or something of, of people. This shot's kind of fun. It sort of jazzes things up a little bit by sweeping around um, Arya as she reacts to the crowd around her. It sort of starts to amp things up from what has been standard coverage up till now. Joffrey calls for Ned Stark's head and he summons Sir Ilan Payne, who is uh, played by Wilco, a famous rock and roller. He was in a band called Dr. Feelgood and he has one of the great faces of uh, rock and roll and great faces of cinema. I'm a huge fan of Ed Sheeran. Uh, my son's a huge fan of Ed Sheeran. We went to see him, uh, but when he turned up on the show, fan reaction was not so positive, which is odd. I'm not sure why. Um, but here, it all started with Wilco, that great name and that great face. Um, Sir Ilan Payne. And perversely, he's using Ned Stark's own sword, which was really heavy. He didn't have that many takes that he could pick it up and swing it. All of our weapons were built by our armorers uh, for the show. I mean, all the ones that are featured. This sword has a, has a history because in the pilot, we, um, we see Ned Stark chop off the head of a, of a guy who's been accused of fleeing the Night's Watch. And he has a beautiful line with his son saying, The man who passes the sentence I should swing the sword. Which is just an insight into Ned's integrity and, and taking responsibility. And so perversely, it's that sword that's being used to um, dispatch him today. Of all the things we did, one of the things I'm most happy with is how we handled sound in this stretch. The sounds of the crowd drop out, and a few things are going on. We lose this ambient sound of the crowd. We go to Ned's subjective experience. We hear his breathing. It takes us into his head and into that sort of extreme frame of mind you get into when something terrible is about to happen. There's also a quality to this shot which is hyper real. There's something about the lighting and the focus on him that is sort of uncanny. And it's that way for a reason because from this point on we're using um, a layering of elements. The background plate of the architecture was married to a shot of Sean Bean that was shot on stage under controlled circumstances so that we could chop his head off. This shot, and it's become the most important shot for me, it's, uh, I didn't mean to use it this way, but the last thing we see Ned Stark look at is the absence of his daughter. So he knows he saved her. She's been taken away. She won't be captured. She won't be watching him die. And so he's got that sort of slight moment of redemption at the end. And just looking at beautiful Sean Bean's beautiful performance and what he's capturing in his eyes as he uh, gets ready to leave this world and leave his daughters. It still gets to me, maybe because I have two daughters. Sean is doing an amazing performance on stage in Belfast. Everything else in the frame uh, is shot in Malta, including Sir Ilan Payne and the swinging sword, ice. So he's basically swinging through, uh, through the air and we're marrying that. We had a dummy, a body dummy, that stopped at the neck, and he's swinging his blade in front of that. Sean's head was shot in Belfast. His performance was shot in Belfast, and we did it in such a way that the camera was on Ned, and in the moment of his death, the camera boomed up very quickly, which gave the effect of the head seeming to roll forward. So we could have dropped the head like a watermelon, and it was decided that, that was just one step too horrible. <laughs> um, so this is all Malta. This is Belfast. If you Frame through very slowly, you'll see the sword actually passes through his neck. So there's the blade. It's just passed through his head in a kind of impossible way because we shot these as different elements. We commit to it. We see the blade actually pass through, but we don't stick around for the, what follows. In the moment of his death, that stops abruptly, and we transfer to his daughter Arya's breathing. And it's the last time we hear in the episode is her breathing on the edge of tears. And we hear the flutter of wings, which is a practical thing because there's birds there, but also a kind of transcendent thing. And it's her breathing and her gaze up to the sky and the sound of the wings and the sound of her breathing that ends the episode, Ned Stark is no more. She will be a major character going forward. We end the episode with her breathing in her sort of desperation. She just looks up to the heavens and she sees a flock of birds going overhead. And it's a scene that started with her murdering a bird and it ends with the birds are alive and her father is gone. The wave of reaction none of us saw coming, and especially for me seeing this one and seeing online people react to the death of this guy and the demographics of covered every, you know, ethnicity, every economic category had really invested in Ned Stark and saw him as their their guy. So it was that was amazing and beautiful.